How is everybody? Yeah. So I must say this group has been a very, very nice group to do retreat with. You know, people have been quite cooperative as far as I could see. And everybody's at session on time. And, uh, you know, that just makes it so much easier to lead a retreat and easier for all the other participants to, you know, settle into retreat. So thank you very much for all your cooperation and goodwill and enthusiasm. So, um, yeah, we'll continue where we left off. And as you think of all the sentient beings around you in human form, contemplate their kindness. So begin with the kindness of the, your friends, then move on to the kindness of strangers, and finally the kindness of those who challenge you to grow. And then with a feeling of being the recipient of kindness. Very important that when we think about the kindness of others, the feeling in us becomes the feeling of, of have, being the recipient of tremendous kindness throughout our whole life. And then with that feeling, then wish to repay the kindness and let love and compassion for others arise. And so, with compassion, then generate the wish to become, or the aspiration, the determination to become a fully awakened Buddha in order to repay the kindness and be of benefit to all these beings.
Okay. Uh, to just a little bit about the mantra, um, when we're in a group, we chant it out loud with the melody. But when you're doing the practice at home alone, um, you don't. You generally use the melody. You just say it. You know, Taito, Bigots, Bigots, Ma, Bigots, Rosa, Samagati. So it just like a flow like that, because uh, you know you're usually trying to to accumulate a lot of mantra, so uh, you don't have to chant the melody. If you like to chant the melody, either silently or out loud, that's perfectly fine. But you don't have to. You can just do it. Just a you know a regular kind of flat, even even what even whatever <laughs> tone, okay. But when you uh, you know sometimes when you're doing the the mantra recitation part, you focus on the uh, visualization, and the mantra is more in the background. Other times you focus more on the the mantra and the feeling of the mantra, the energy of the mantra, and the visualization is is not as clear. And sometimes they're both quite clear. So, um, you know, and again, don't expect it to be like you're seeing things with your eyes. You know, visualization is not like that. Uh, and, um, yeah, with the mantra, I mean, there's a certain energy that comes through the mantra. You can feel it when we chanted together as a group and uh, you know when you do the practice yourself too uh, you know you can feel the energy of the mantra and uh, let your energy uh, be the energy of the mantra you know make the the rhythm or the tone of the mantra what your uh, physical mental energy is yeah, because usually our energy is, well, anxiety energy, isn't it? That's the kind of usual one people are on, or hurried energy, stressed energy. My energy, you know, I've got to do this, got to do that. <laughs> you know, or oh, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want that. Or, oh, I don't mind it, you know. And, and so all these moods and, you know, mental states affect our physical energy, too. So here, when you're chanting the mantra, you're uh, letting your being sink into that energy, okay? Because what a mantra is, is an expression of a Buddha's realization. So when they have that realization, it gets expressed in the sound of the mantra. We recite this, the mantra in an attempt to go the other direction into that mental state. Yeah. And some days you'll find your energy goes flows very smoothly with the energy of the mantra, and some days it's like, and that tells you something about what you need to work on that day. Yeah. Okay, so we did the first six um, of the Buddha, the Medicine Buddha's twelve great vows or great unshakable resolves. So again, this is from the Sutra on the merits of the fundamental unshakable vows of the Master of Healing, the Lapis Lazuli Radiance Tathagata. And so when, you know, when we're reciting the mantra, the, the mantra is, contains the name of the medicine Buddha. Yeah. Most mantras at some point contain the, the name of that particular deity. Uh, so it makes us think, you know, what, what's so, uh, important about a name? Yeah. And, there's a lot of meaning in that question when you start reflecting on the two truths. Okay, so the seventh uh, unshakable resolve. I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, if there are any sentient beings who are ill and oppressed, who have nowhere to go and nothing to return to, 
who have neither doctor nor medicine, neither relatives nor immediate family, who are destitute and whose sufferings are acute. As soon as my name passes through their ears, they will be cured of all their diseases and they will be peaceful and joyous in body and mind. They will have plentiful families and property and they will personally experience supreme awakening. This is is one that uh, I resonate with a lot because it makes me think of uh, refugees throughout the world and homeless people and people who, uh, you know, battered people, people who really have nowhere to turn and, uh, you know, no aid coming to them, including from the government. You know, sometimes the government is even hostile towards them. So, of course, the government is the people, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, to really wish these people well, and even if I can uh, right now change the whole situation, even the medicine Buddha can't change the whole situation, you know, because remember the power of the Buddha and the power of sentient beings' karma is equal. Yeah. So, uh, Buddha is not omnipotent. Yeah. Omniscient, yes. Knowing everything, yes. Omnipotent, no. Okay, and that's one of the difficulties in believing in God is God is supposed to be omnipotent, in which case he should be able to fix everything right away. And he created the mess to start with. So, you know, uh, when, when you, you know, are trying to get clear what you believe in, you have to use reasoning you know, to examine this. Anyway, so, um, you know, to, to really think of being able to, you know, extending our love and compassion to these, to all these people who are destitute, either because of poverty or social illness and social, uh, you know, everything falling apart in the country where they live in. Um, you know, we do what we can, but we also, remain emotionally connected to them by making these kinds of aspirations. And when we do the medicine Buddha practice, uh, we can imagine them specifically with medicine Buddha around on their heads and flowing down, purifying them, bringing them understanding of the Dharma, transforming their bodies and minds into something peaceful and joyful. Okay, and so, you know, that that keeps us connected so that when we can do something, we do do something. Okay. Okay, then the eighth uh, great vow. I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, if there are any women who suffer from any of the 100 ro- woes, that befall women who are wearied at the end of their lives and wish to abandon their female form. When these women hear my name, they will all obtain transformation and rebirth from female into male physical forms. They will all personally experience supreme awakening. So I remember some years ago when we did Medicine Buddha Retreat and I was going through these uh, unshakable resolves, and I read that. The reaction from the women in the group was very interesting. One person was livid, totally livid. You know, it's like, you know, this is just thinking women are inferior and we can't do anything and we have to be men to do anything and it's sexist and it's misogynist. And, you know, this this is patriarchy and Buddhism, and we've got to purge this from Buddhism altogether. So one person reacted like that. One other person said, oh, you know, she was a mother. The first one wasn't a mother. The second one was a mother. She said, 
oh, it's so nice to have empathy from the Buddhas for what you go through as a mother, giving birth and raising children and having that whole experience. And I really feel like the the Medicine Buddha cares about uh, us women because we do face difficulties that men do, don't face, you know, in motherhood and also in the fact that society, you know, we're second place citizens of society. So I feel like the Medicine Buddha is extending empathy and compassion towards us. So we had one person reacting this way, one person reacting this way, everybody else in the group somewhere in between. Okay? So I found that extremely interesting. Yeah? That how each person reacts to this is is coming from, uh, you know, their own perspective and their own needs. So... uh, I will leave it to you to figure out how you react. Because <laughs> I've kind of presented both viewpoints, and some of you are probably with one and some with the other, and some somewhere in between. Um, but I think one of the things is to realize also that Buddhism was is never free. Well, okay, put it this way. The The path to awakening is completely free of patriarchy, misogyny, discrimination of any sort. Okay. The path to awakening is just dealing with our mind and transforming our mind and purifying it and gaining all the good qualities. Okay. The path is taught in societies, and societies have prejudices and (laughs) discriminations and social status and all that kind of stuff. Societies are created by human beings, and human beings' afflictions, okay? And so sometimes in the way the teachings are explained or the way they are uh, translated throughout the ages as they're passed down, they accumulate the, uh, the things of society. Okay. So, uh, you know, for example, we do the mandala offering. Yeah. Mount Meru, the four continents, the eight subcontinents, the different sides of Mount Meru are what causes, uh, in our continent, we're in the southern continent, for the sky to be blue, you know, and then another side is red, and in that continent, the sky is red. And, you know, and this was the ancient Indian view of and the, what people believed and what the Tibetans believed. And it was only when they came into exile that His Holiness got interested in science and it was explained to him how actually the world was not flat because the old Indian view, you know, the world is flat. Mount Meru and the four continents and everything is on one plane. And and the Abhidharma texts talk about how far the sun and moon are away from the earth. And, you know, the Tibetan Geshis, who are brilliant people, they believe this literally. And when His Holiness started saying, well, actually, you know, uh, because one thing that really shook them up was when some of the Geshis started to go to the West to teach, and they would get on the phone with one of their Geshe friends in India, and they would say, good morning. And the Gesh, their Geshe friend in India said, it's nighttime, it's dark here. And that is according to the scientific view of the world being round. If the world were flat, it should be daytime for everybody. And that really threw these Geshe's and Rinpoche's for a loop. You know, like, wait a minute. And then 
His Holiness started to explain, you know, how the scientists measure things and that the measurements for the sun and the moon were not what they are in the Abhidharma. And the earth really was round, and here's the proof of it. And one of my my Dharma sisters, when we were studying in France with one of my dear teachers, who I love so much, who, you know, thought the world was flat. And, you know, and... And according to that, so many, his view in the Abhidharma, so many, uh, Pakse, um, Pakse is an ancient Indian measurement of distance. We converted it to miles, you know, so many Pakse be- beneath the surface of Bogaya is where the hell realms were located. So she figured all this out with the version of the of the earth being round, and uh, it came out that the hell realms were in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did she explain that? You know, okay, <laughs> you know, where some of your students live, this is, you know, where the Abhidharma says the hell realms are located. So slowly, slowly, the Tibetans are starting to change their views, okay? So this is an example of how, you know, things are taught within a culture that has it their own views. So as we know, most of the cultures in the world had a very patriarchal view because men were stronger. Look at those muscles. Yeah, okay? And <laughs> His Holiness now says that, you know, that, he says, violence is old-fashioned. Of course, many people still don't believe that. Um, and, and and so we don't need to, f- to depend on physical strength anymore. And, uh, you know, even if you believe violence is good, women can now have guns, so it doesn't matter how tall and how, you know, big you are. Anyway... Uh, you know, so he's saying, look, this thing of, you know, men being strong and able and, you know, women not is, is old fashioned. It doesn't apply to our, our modern culture. Okay. Well, there are still things that women face that men don't. You don't have a men's Me Too movement. Okay. So Me Too is something you know, predominantly for women. I think some men have faced that, but they don't have a movement about it. Um, So, and in the West, things are changing. Um, My experience is I still find some people who are quite patriarchal. And, um, you know, the, it, well, I mean, as, in the West, it's one thing. In, in Tibet, I just expect that. Even though some of my Tibetan friends, the, the younger generation of, Gesh, of Geshis, have a different idea. Some do, some don't. Um, the, but among the Western, Western too, in, too, it's interesting. Some of the monks, they follow the old Western monks, you know, the ones you grow up with still follow this old view and, you know, you know, we're monks and blah, 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 you know. But then, uh, uh, you know, men in general in the West, a lot of them don't like the, the patriarchy and they want to have more women teachers in Buddhism and more equality. Yeah. So it's very much up to the, to the individual. My personal feeling is if Buddhism is going to spread in, uh, Western cultures, uh, you know, that old idea isn't going to prevent it from spreading, you know, which would be really a tragedy because then everybody misses out on the beauty of the Buddhist teachings. So I think, you know, in coming to the West, that is going to have to change. Change happens gradually, as we all know. And, uh, yeah, but it is in the process of changing. Okay. 
I could go on about that for a long time, but I will spare you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, then the ninth uh, uh, resolve. Okay. I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, I will cause all sentient beings to escape from Mara's net. Mara is the personification of hindrance. Okay. Uh, some people, you know, in some of the, the scriptures, he's presented as an actual being. Uh, he may be, there may be an actual being of Mara, but also uh, he's the personification of death, of our afflictions, okay, of uh, all the various hindrances that we, we face. Okay, so I will cause ill sentient beings to escape from Mara's net. They will be freed from the fetters of all deviant paths. Tonight, when we, uh, in the teaching tonight, when we continue with the mental factors, I'll be talking about the fetters. Okay, um, if there are those who have sunk into various wrong views as dense as a jungle, I will embrace them and establish them in correct views. I will gradually cause them to cultivate and study all the bodhisattva practices, and they will soon personally experience supreme awakening. Okay. This is another one that, uh, that I resonate with a lot. Uh, and like I said, everybody's going to resonate with different of, of, these, of these different unshakable resolves. Um, because this is dealing with people in deviant paths, people who have very firm r wrong views, okay, that they have learned in this lifetime. Yeah, our, uh, some of our wrong views are innate. Um, some, you know, like the self-grasping ignorance, but some of our wrong views, you know, most of them, we learn in this lifetime. So what are wrong views? For example, thinking uh, that your religion is the one and only right religion for everybody, and that killing heretics who don't believe in your religion is good. Okay, purging the world of all the heretics, all the heathens, that that's good. Yeah, killing the enemies of your religion is good. Okay, there are people on this planet who believe that. Okay, I would include with this all kind of racist, sexist, religionist, ethnicist, any kind, any kind of, uh, you know, bias and prejudice that one uh, group based on superficial factors, is superior to another group. And yet those kind of views are rampant in the world because everybody likes to feel like they're in the best group. You know? Where, where does that view come from? Why do we feel that way? Again, our self-grasping ignorance, which is the root of our samsara. Yeah, but... Based on that, then we have this, uh, this pseudoscience that, what was it, e eugenetics or something? Eugenics. Yeah, eugenics, yeah. You have that, you have all sorts of things, yeah. So these kind of, of views, which are, you know, uh, are very detrimental. Because the thing about wrong views are when you hold the wrong view, they usually give you permission to do all sorts of harmful things against other living beings. So just thinking the view doesn't harm anybody. But most people live according to what their views are. So if you have a, a very horrible wrong view, yeah, like that, then you act it out and create great damage uh, to society and incredible pain to individuals in that society. 
Yeah, so that's why they say of the 10 uh, non-virtues, wrong views is actually the most damaging, even though it's a mental wrong view, that uh, it's a mental non-virtue that occurs only in your mind. It's because of its power. And throughout history, when we look, you know, so many wars have been fought based on these kind of wrong views. You know, it usually starts out, you have the view, the self-grasping ignorance, then you have attachment to self, then you have economic concerns, okay, which often fuel wars. But if you want to really get people hyped up over economic things so that they want to fight a war, you have to bring religion in. And if you look at European history, every single generation, people are killing each other in the name of God. Every single generation. If you look at the cultural culture wars, which are tearing this country apart, you know, nobody's so much fighting about policy. It's the, th it's the culture wars that, that, uh, you know, get people so hyped up because they all entail a belief in, you know, their religion and what their religion tells them is right and wrong. Okay. And so you get all hyped up that, you know, you're going to deny the Eucharist to President Biden because he doesn't want to, he has his own view about abortion, but he doesn't want to force it on other people, you know. And then you have other people who get shaken up, uh, you know. I mean, but so many, so much of this stuff, I don't want to bake a cake for a gay couple, you know, because that, you know, God said, blah, blah. And, well, God also said, love thy neighbor as thyself, but somehow that gets left out of it. Okay? So, you know, you, you find people, you know, this, what's behind ISIS? Yeah, what was behind Al Qaeda? Yeah, yes, there were political and financial concerns, but what really gets people fired up is their religion. And what they're told is the one truth that you need to believe in or else. Yeah, and the or else is a very strong factor in getting people to believe things. Okay. And, and so this creates a lot of problems. So when it's talking about deviant views and helping sentient beings with deviant views, yeah, because I'm sure we all know people who are just incredibly stuck in whatever they believe, so much so that they don't even want to talk to people who have different views. Yeah? Which is a tragedy when we live in the same country and we have to share things. Okay? Which now is every country in the world, you know? In, in ancient times, maybe you had smaller countries and so you could have more homogeneous populations. But now you cannot find one single country that where the whole population is homogeneous in terms of religion, ethnicity, race, whatever, you know, even language. No? So every country is faced now with this thing of how can you help people get along without fracturing into us and them, my group and other people's group. And of course, my group is always the one that's best. Okay. 
So this is where I feel when we talk about equanimity in Buddhism, you know, why, and we talk about love and compassion and joy and equanimity, you know, we have to apply those not just to our personal life, but to our life as members of society. And we can't force other people to have love, compassion, joy, and equanimity because it's those are the right things that any society should value. And if you don't value them, you're going to hell. You know, we don't, we shouldn't be saying stuff like that. Okay. We have to live it, but it needs to influence how we relate to other people that we share this planet with and other living creatures, not just human beings, that we share this planet with. Okay? So I don't think uh, religion is just Sunday morning stuff. It's got to influence, you know, how we live our lives and how we conduct ourselves as citizens in uh societies that are not homogeneous. Okay, personally, I feel living with people who are different is really fascinating. And the time that I, I am not a particularly patriotic person, you know, I don't go in for that kind of thing. But the thing, uh, I value American ideals, but, you know, my country, right or wrong, mm -mm. I grew up during Vietnam, so I don't hold that view. Um, but the time that I feel uh, most proud of America is when I stand in the line, the passport lines to re-entry this, in, enter this country. And you stand in the line and you look in front and there's back and there's all sorts of different people holding an American passport. Different colors, wearing different clothes, different languages sometimes. That's when I feel most proud of what America is. Yeah. For other people, that's when they feel least proud. Okay. But for me, you know, the fact that we can accommodate so many different people who are welcome here is, is the strength of the country. Yeah. Okay, that is my political um, <laughs> talk for today. You know, get me on a soapbox. But um, like I said, I don't think that, that uh, our spiritual beliefs and our life as citizens of, in a country should be different. And many other people feel the same way, which is why the cultural wars are so strong, because they have their views taught by their God, you know? But uh, personally speaking, I think Jesus would be really horrified at what is being done in his name. Yeah? And uh, our Catholic sisters who are friends hold the same view. So, yeah. Pardon? I think Mohammed would Yeah, probably Mohammed would too. Yeah. And Moses. Yeah. <laughs> we got to get them all involved there. Yeah. Okay, so the ninth, that was the ninth view. The tenth uh, one, the ninth view, the ninth <laughs> unshakable resolve, the tenth one is I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, if according to that which is recorded in the king's laws, there are any sentient beings who are bound and whipped, tied up and thrown into prison, or who will be subjected to capital punishment and to whom boundless catastrophic difficulties occur that are humiliating, grievous, and distressing, their bodies and minds suffering this bitterness. 
If such persons hear my name due to the awesome spiritual force of my auspicious virtues, they will be freed from all sorrows and sufferings. Okay? So can you imagine if you, you know, our country has the highest rate in the world, I think, of incarceration for its citizens. Yeah? We're the country who believes in freedom with the highest rate of incarceration. And the people incarcerated are by majority minorities. Yeah? Uh, the whole police system is very interesting. Research how the police and the criminal justice or the criminal injustice system came into being. And it has to do with racism and capturing slaves that ran away. And you have your posses of citizens who are empowered by the citizenry to catch all the runaway slaves. Even if they go to the, no even if they went to the north, where they were supposedly free, there were people there who captured them and returned them to the South and got paid a bounty. That was how the police force began in this country. We didn't, I never knew that until recent years. Yeah. So, and when you get to know some of the people who are incarcerated, yes, some of the people I have met while incarcerated um, have mental illness, and they, they need a lot more help than they're getting by being incar incarcerated, okay? Some of them have drug problems and alcohol problems, yeah. Uh, they do have AA and uh, NA in prisons, but a lot of the programs have been cut because of budgets. So again, those people are not always getting the help that they need. Yeah, they have SO, sexual offenders programs in prisons. Those budgets get, get cut too. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on and on about the prison system. But, um, you know, are people being helped? by being incarcerated, you know, the flavor uh, of the prison system since the 90s has been punishment. Yeah, if you punish people, that's what they deserve. And there's not really much of a thought of rehabilitation. This is beginning to change a little bit now. Yeah, uh, Biden stopped federal... Uh, uh, executions after Trump, you know, had many people executed right before his his reign ended, his uh, administration ended. Um, you know, so really looking at the prison system and how much potential we lose as a country by locking certain people up. Yeah, because these people have the potential to be good citizens, and but they need help, you know. Also, uh, you know, what the system does is not fair and equal to everybody, as George Floyd and everything that happened after that has clearly brought to people's attention. Uh, I had never realized, you know, my ignorance, how much discrimination they faced, in uh, minorities faced, in terms of uh, being killed by the police. I knew that being arrested, there was discrimination, you know, because the police go into minority communities and where so much of the life happens on the streets because your home life is terrible, you know, in white communities, especially uh, wealthy or middle-class communities, you know, drug dealing, where does it happen? Inside buildings, 
Police can't catch you so easily. You know, minority communities, it's done on the street. They can easily arrest people. Okay? So, uh, you know, you, you, there's so much potential in those people. Some of them I write to are just incredible human beings. Uh, what was the name of the documentary we saw? It was, there was a university on the East Coast the name started with a B, and they were holding, uh, giving, holding classes in one prison. Remember we watched that documentary? Anybody remember that? Uh, anyway, it was about this university, and they were having classes in a, in a prison offering people, uh, you know, a BA degree or a BS degree. And it was incredible because it showed the development of these people, how they got so fascinated by what they were studying. And they wrote, uh, you know, theses about it. They had to write a thesis. And the ideas they came up with and what they, you know, wrote on, and we saw parts of their oral examination, I mean, they were brilliant. Yeah, and it, we, and it, none of us remember the name of that. How is that? Yes, like oh, yeah, something behind bars. Yeah. Uh, can't remember exactly, but anyway, it was brilliant. And I can't remember the name of the of the school either, but. What? College behind bars. Okay. And what was the name of the, the university? Because the professors went into the prison to teach. You know, I. Bar, barred, yes. See, I knew it started with a B. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bard uni University or college? College? Yeah. So, it was brilliant, you know? And uh, so much more could be done, you know, rather than, uh, especially when you lock up the young guys, they learn from the older guys who have been imprisoned a long time. And then they're released, they're angry, they're bitter, they have no, they grew up in a community where they don't have any vision for what kind of life they could live except what everybody before them has done. Yeah, which you wind up in prison. So, I mean, there's so much that could be done. Uh, and, to, and it's not a thing of just you help those people. You help the entire country when you help people who are you know, who have committed crimes. And you help the entire country when you let people out of prison who have been unfairly convicted, yeah, because prosecutors want to have more conviction because it looks better when they run for re-election, yeah. I'm working with one guy now who, you know, who didn't commit the crime, yeah, and he's, you know, actually, July 8th was his, one of his hearings. That's yesterday. Okay. So, you know, another guy who I wrote to for years got executed again for uh, something he didn't do. And I talked to, his lawyer came out here and told us about the whole case. And she thinks she knows who was who actually did it, but, you know, by the time it got to her, yeah, it, the courts wouldn't accept any more appeals. In any case, yeah, um, can you imagine being locked up, whether you did the crime or not, and hearing this kind of vow that, you know, Medicine Buddha understands what you're going through and cares about you? Yeah, and so 
you know, if such persons hear my name due to the awesome spiritual force of my auspicious virtues, they will be freed from all sorrows and sufferings. Yeah? So that kind of thing can, can really bolster uh, hope in, you know, in the minds of some of the incarcerated people. And like I said, some of them are, are very good practitioners. Okay, then 11th. I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, if there are any sentient beings who are tormented by hunger and thirst and who create bad karma in their desperate search for sustenance, if they hear my name and firmly retain it in their minds and hold to it, then I will provide them first with incomparably marvelous food and drink to fully satisfy their bodies. Afterwards, through providing them with the taste of the teachings, they will ultimately become peaceful and joyous and well-established in it. Okay, so those of us who have in mind, do you remember the photo of, I think it was in Dafur, someplace in Africa, of the emaciated child with a vulture sitting next to him? Do you remember that photo? That is implanted in my mind, you know? So this is is reaching out to those people, as well as, you know, the homeless people and the the families, impoverished families in our country, um, as well as, you know, to the hungry ghosts. Mm -hmm. So, again, uh, you know, providing them, what this uh, unshakable resolve also shows is that if you want to guide people in the path, path, first you have to meet their physical needs. So first, Medicine Buddha gives them food, you know, and, and not just any food, tasty food that they want to eat according to their culture, according to what their body hand, can handle, okay? Then, so he satisfies the physical needs then he teaches the Dharma. Because if people's physical needs aren't meant, it's very difficult to sit and listen to teachings or to practice teachings. Okay? So that's why, you know, practical generosity is so important on the path to alleviate all kinds, not only the physical suffering, but the mental suffering. And the twelfth uh, unshakable resolve, I vow that when I attain awakening in a future age, if there are any sentient beings who are poor and having no clo- clothing are annoyed and irritated through the day and night by flies and mosquitoes and ticks, <laughs> heat and heat <laughs> and cold, If they hear my name and firmly retain it in their minds and hold to it in accordance with their wishes, they will obtain all sorts of superior and marvelous clothing. They will also obtain every precious adornment, garlands, powder, incense, music, and the enjoyment of various performing arts. I shall cause them to have in abundance whatever their hearts desire. So again, meeting the physical needs. And in this case, you know, talking about people who are poor, poor people have physical needs. They also have the need for respect. Yeah. Because often when people are impoverished or they're ill or they're injured, yeah, they have the physical problem plus the fact that society looks down on them and says they must be stupid. Yeah, they must be, something's wrong with them, okay, that they're poor. Something's wrong with them, you know, that they're uh, they're handicapped. 
Yeah, we don't want to see those people. We don't want to deal with them. And so often the ostracization by society is just as painful for people as the poverty. Okay? We, when I was teaching in Seattle, we talked about this. And uh, one of the, the people in the class, uh, you know, when he had to go to uh, Berkeley and Oakland for some time, you know, something. And he came back and he told us the story of he was walking, uh, you know, in Berkeley and in Oakland. There's lots of people who are poor, okay? And they sit on the street and, you know, they panhandle and they have their their bowls. And he, we had been talking about generosity in class. And he said there was one woman who was just sitting like this with her bowl and, you know, like, looking terrible. And uh, so he, he pulled out some money, he put it in her bowl, and he looked her in the eyes and he said, I wish I could give more. And she started crying because somebody respected her. Somebody looked at her. In class, we had talked about when you give, you don't just Put it there and walk away. You look at the person. You give with both your hands. And that's exactly what this person did when he gave to that woman. And it was the respect, I think, you know. It wasn't the money. She's gotten money before. It was the respect that made her tear up. Yeah. So I think that is, is something to always bear in mind. So that's what Medicine Buddha is giving people, okay? Not only their physical needs, but adornments and garlands and nice clothes and performing arts so that they can be like everybody else in society. They are no longer co considered lower class. You know, people who haven't picked themselves up by their own bootstraps, because they don't have boots. Okay? <laughs> so, yeah. So, Nanjushri, these are the, so the Buddha was speaking on these. Uh, no, medicine, yeah, the Buddha told Manjushri that this, he's saying what, what medicine Buddha pledged. So Manjushri, these are the 12 subtle, sublime, and superior, unshakable resolves expressed by that Lord Master of Healing, the Lapis Lazuli Radiance Tathagata, when he set out onto the Bodhisattva path. Okay, so that is an example for us also of how to practice. Yeah. Okay, so the retreat is drawing to an end. I wanted to just give a little bit of advice that you haven't asked for <laughs> that I hope will be helpful. Because in past retreats, people have asked for it. So I'm imputing that, that you have the same question. Um, the question is usually, what do I do now? Okay, the retreat was wonderful. How, uh, what do I practice now? Okay, you practice the same thing you learned in retreat. Yeah, You don't stop, you know, like, okay, I did retreat on Medicine Buddha. Okay, I'm done with you. Now what do I practice? No, you started this practice you're familiar with it. You know how to do the practice. You know how to incorporate into it long rim re uh, meditation and reflection on the different meditations. You know, and you've had some teachings on that. And there's lots of books, uh, you know, that you can read on it. There's a guide, you know, 
if you get guided meditate, no, they retitled it. What's the new? Buddhist, guided Buddhist meditations. Yeah, they retitled the book. That's also downstairs. So uh, there's in it a way online where you can access the meditations that are recorded so you can do guided meditations, you know, uh, with, without hearing your neighbor's cough. Yeah. <laughs> um, cause it was pre recorded. And every time the cat started purring, we had to start over. <laughs> cause we were recording this in the place I lived. And my cat, who's uh, named Manjushri, he's no longer with us. But Manjushri, you know, he loved to sit in your lap when you're meditating. So he would come and sit in my lap and start purring. And the purring would get recorded. On, on, and we had to start the meditation over again, uh, asking Manjushri, please, to, you know, go in another room or go outside. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So you can download these uh, online. Yeah, there's the, the website mention. In any case, uh, yeah, continue doing what you're doing now. You have a routine practice, uh, a, a routine set up of morning and evening practice. Continue with that. Start tonight. Okay. You know, when you go back and you see, you know, whoever you live with, if you live with people, um, don't feel like you have to tell everybody everything that happened in the retreat because you're still processing it and you're still developing it. And they will want to tell you everything that happened to them during the retreat, like the washing machine broke and, you know, and this broke and that broke and, you know, this and that happened. And okay. So, uh, you know, be sensitive to the people that you live with. Listen to them. Okay. Don't have a super long conversation. They might ask you about your retreat and what you learned. Share a little bit. If they want to know more in the upcoming days, they will ask you more and then you keep sharing. Yeah. Um, so you have to share according to how much they want to hear. And you will be surprised. Some people that you think will be very interested are not. And other people who you think would be least interested would be very interested. Yeah. So continue with your practice, you know, set it up. Uh, you know, if you can't do the practice as long as we do it here, shorten it a little bit so it fits with your schedule. Yeah, go to bed earlier. You really don't need to stay up so late chatting with your friends or, or you know, watching porn on the Internet. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you cut that stuff out, you're going to have a lot more time for practice. Kathy's group, you can join. The information is on the Shravasti Abbey website. Um, so... You know, keep up your practice. Uh, we, there's teachings Thursday mornings and, and, uh, uh, Friday evenings that are live streamed. I'm sure that Venerable Sompton has recited all the things, uh, available to everybody several times. And Venerable Chuni has probably filled in whatever else, uh, she forgot. And so take advantage of what is live streamed and, you know, and take advantage of all the archives that, uh, Venerable, her, yeah, Venerable Damcha and her whole team, which consists of several others here, uh, have put online, you know, there's lots of archives of teachings and then plan to come to another retreat. Okay. So, um, or come visit us even when there's not a retreat. That's even better. Then you can experience the forest, which is, you know, another experience altogether, which is really nice. Okay, so just, uh, you know, keep up with uh, what you're doing. Um, 
Yeah. What else to say? Uh, oh, another another little piece. You may probably feel that your mind is still so distracted and you can't concentrate. But after a week, your mind is quieter than it was when you came here. You may not realize that, but it is quieter. So don't get in your car and turn on the radio. Yeah, don't stop at, I know it's going to be difficult. You've gone a whole week without coffee. But, you know, don't stop at Starbucks uh, on the way to, the, to wherever you're going uh, and listen to the music and, you know, all that stuff because your mind is more sensitive now than it was before. So, you know, let, enjoy the, the mental quiet and, and try and keep that going. Okay, any last questions or comments? This picture of His yeah, Holiness. I think Where's you going? <laughs> you gifted it. No, who was it? Oh, yeah, it was Kadro.